the book of Deuteronomy chapter 9. Alright, Deuteronomy chapter 9, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. Alright, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom thou knowest, and of whom thou hast heard say, Who can stand before the children of Anak? Understand, therefore, this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them, and he shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. Speak not in thine heart. After that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, and for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee, not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Let's just go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this um, time that we can come before your word now, once again, Lord. And Lord, we know that we are small in number, but we know wherever two or three are gathered together, we know that you are there in the midst of them. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for being our saviour. And Lord, today as we come before your word, please Lord, allow us to understand who and what we are before thy face. A stiff-necked people. Lord, we just thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in our passage of scripture this morning that we've just read, we see God speaking to Israel and God basically says to Israel that thou art to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess uh, nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. We know that God wanted Israel to possess a land that he was to give them. That was his promise. That was his covenant that he made not only to uh, the Israelites that were alive and present that day when God was speaking to them, but he also promised it to Abraham a man of great faith who um, didn't physically see the land which God had promised to his um, descendants, but he believed it by faith. 
he saw it through faith. And Abraham lived his faith. We're going to see a little bit about that in our second service today. So not only did it promise it to the Israelites who were living in the day that God said, thou art to pass over Jordan this day. You know, today is the day that you need to pass over and today is the day that you need to possess that land. It wasn't something that God said to them, if you would like to just go over and possess it. It was a commandment. Go and possess this land this day. He said he had already promised it to them in verse 5. He says, uh, which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. It wasn't just Abraham, it was Isaac and it was Jacob as well. But I think the most important thing that we see in this passage of scripture, it wasn't just that God was going to give them the land. God says to them that basically when you see this land, you will see nations, nations, not just a nation, but nations that are going to be greater than what you are. And sometimes when we see something that is greater than what we are, we think to ourselves that this is impossible. But the Bible says that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. And God is there and he says, you're going to see these nations that are greater and mightier than thyself. A people, in verse 2, great and tall. Yeah, there's giants in that land. And those giants, you know, you might have looked at them in a physical stature and you might have seen that those giants might have been big and muscly, built like a house, as they might say today. And they might have seen those people and they might have thought, no, this is impossible. But nothing is impossible with God. Verse 2, he says, um, the children of the Anakims. Now he says about the Anakims here, he says, whom thou knowest. They've got a bit of a reputation, the Anakims. Why? Because they say, who can stand before the children of Anak? Yeah, there's a lot of nations today who say, who can stand before us? We're greater and mightier than thou. Like a China. A China. Who today in the news say that they're building up their troops to invade Taiwan. Now, the... Um, I don't know what the leader of... Is it the Prime Minister or something of Taiwan? Whoever the leader is there. He says that he's only got like, I can't remember, I think it was around 200 or 250,000 troops, where China has got a million. There's a bit of a difference in numbers there. So the um, leader of Taiwan, to try and prevent an invasion, has sent something like 5,000 troops to this island to try and, if China does invade, to try and slow the progression of the Chinese. And you might see that um, scenario and you might think to yourself, well, I'm sorry, but I don't think Taiwan's got much hope. You know, China has already taken some land of the Philippines and the Philippines president says, well, what can I do? I can't do anything. I've got no money to send the troops out. I've got no ability to fight against them. So I just have to allow them to take the land. And for Israel, when they saw the Anakims in there, and God says, you know, you know what their reputation is like. 
You know that they say, who can stand against us? We're mighty and we're strong. Nobody can come in and possess our land. Verse 3, God says, understand. Right, Israel, you need to understand something. And so did the Anakims. See, these nations who are mighty and strong, who have, in verse 1, great fenced cities, which their, you know, their um, fences or their boundaries seem to go all the way up to heaven. It just seems impenetrable to even think about invading that. A bit like Jericho in the day. You know, Jericho was a city of a great war. There wasn't going to be too many things that was actually going to penetrate that wall that was so thick and so high until God came along. And it seemed like they were up against a mighty and impenetrable fence city. But you see, Israel followed God's commandment in walking around that city all those times that they did and then the last time blow the trumpet and have a great shout and what happened the walls of Jericho came tumbling down God gave them the victory in a time when it just seemed like it was not able to happen but God in verse 3 says, understand. Right, you need to understand something. Therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. You've got to ask yourself, why did Israel actually decide to go back into the wilderness? Why did they? Why did they decide to go back into the wilderness after God said all these things? Like, sure, you're going to see these people there. They're going to look mightier and stronger than you. And they may well be stronger and mightier than you. But you need to understand something. You need to understand that I... The Lord thy God is he which goeth over before thee. So God was going to go before them and he was going to go before they even stepped into that land and he was going to give them the victory. How do we know this? Look at the rest of verse 3. So he's going to go over before them as a consuming fire. Now we know um, in God's word that fire is a picture of judgment. And if we really have a look at that word consuming there, you know what that really means? To soften. To soften. So think about this. There's all these mighty nations that say, look at us, we're great and strong until God comes along and softens their ability to fight. they got no chance against the living God. Amen. No chance. He is going to judge them. He says... He shall destroy them because of their pride, because of their sin. Let's have a look here. And he shall bring them down before thy face. Man, Israel, you notice here, Israel doesn't have to do anything. All they have to do is fulfill God's commandment. All they have to do is to go in 
behind God, you notice God is before them. Just like he was when they came out of Egypt. Just like he was when um, he was in that um, cloud guiding them or a fire by night guiding them. The one that went before them to go behind them to protect them from the Egyptian army. This is the God that provided everything for them. And now this is a God that continues to say, look, I am here still. I'm going before you. I shall destroy all the nations and bring them down. That's a softening. Before thy face. And then he says, so shalt thou drive them out. Sometimes we think our situation is impossible until we understand that God is there with us. Oh, well, how is this coronavirus ever going to go? Oh, there's thousands dying. Hundreds of thousands. It seems to be popping up all over the place. How are we going to defeat it? Well, we're not. What? No, we're not. But God can. He can defeat anything. He can drive out anything. And he says, and destroy them quickly. You see, what we need to understand... What we need to understand is that God, the supreme being, the one that created this world and others, the one that stood there and spoke it into the existence, the one that is omnipotent, the one that is all-powerful, the one that man cannot fight against, no matter what they think. He is the one that was there for Israel and he is the one that is there for us. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. We often think to ourselves that the devil is winning. And he might seem like he is at the moment. But you know, God has already won the victory. Amen. He has already won the victory. He says to Israel, I have already won the victory for you. But there's something else that he wants to tell Israel. Verse 4. Is this actually sinking? What's this? Verse 4. He says, Speak not thou in thine heart. Now, if... Well, let's put it this way. If you have the victory in anything, yeah, it's very easy to get lifted up. Yeah, you think about, um, for the prayer promise earlier, um, Brother Lamb showed that lady who was running that race. And she tripped and fell. And then she was able to get back up and she was able to run that race and she pretty much won the race at the end. Now, she didn't win it by much. You could say that um, there was a hair in it at the end. But nonetheless, you know, the, the um, commentators said um, there was not much hope that she was basically going to win that race. Pay the price. 
Yeah, she's going to pay the price for tripping because now she doesn't have much chance of winning. At the end of that race, she could have stood up and says, yeah, I'm the greatest, like we've heard many other people say in the world. I am the greatest. Who was it, Muhammad Ali? Yeah, well, he's a man that's very sick and ill. Is he still alive? No. He no. Parkinson's disease, I think he had, at the end. And you look at that man at towards the end of his life and you think, you're the greatest. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. I am the greatest. Well, on the side of Almighty God, you're not the greatest. Yeah, we're very easily lifted up with pride. But God is very quick to put us back into our spot. To humble us. To soften us. He says in verse 4, Speak not. Thou in thine heart after the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. You see, for Israel, it wasn't because they were something great that God allowed them to go in or was going to allow them to go in and to possess that land. It wasn't because they were anything great. He said, it's not because of thy righteousness. It was because of the wickedness of these nations. It was because of their sin that God was going to drive them out to allow Israel to possess that land. If you think about that word wickedness that the Lord uses in verse 4, you could easily think about mankind in general. Turn to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Getting a bit nervous. Brother Lamon always seems to go to a book that I'm going to preach from. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 64. Now, we could say when we read this, oh yeah, Pastor, those nations were definitely like that. Because we read here, but we are all as an unclean thing. You see, before God, those nations that were in that land that God wanted Israel to possess, they were to God as an unclean thing. See, God says that they're wicked. He says, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. He goes on in Isaiah 64, verse 6, not only are we all as an unclean thing, but all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You see, we think we're something great. We might be lifted up in pride or with pride. We might think we're strong and mighty. But before God, we, we are all as an unclean thing. And really, we are not righteous before God. We are filthy. And we all do fade as a leaf. You see, at the end of the day, our life is just a brittle thing. Weak. 
Sure, we get lifted up in pride and we might be young. You know, my boys always try to prove their strength to each other. No, nah, mate, I can do 10 push-ups. And no, nah, no, nah, I can do 20. And then, oh, how many sit-ups can you do? And how many of these can you do? And can you lift that? And can you do this? And no, nah, no, nah, I'm the greatest of them all. And you sit back and you think to yourself, yeah, before God, you guys are really nothing. And sure, you can have your competitions between yourselves, which is fine. But still, in the sight of God, we do fade. Yeah, when you get a bit older, you feel like you're fading. I do. I feel like I'm fading as a leaf. Yeah, in wintertime, you see those leaves dry up and drop off the tree. That's where I feel. I feel like I'm fading, brittle, and feel like I want to drop off the perch off the tree, you know, as that leaf. And our iniquities, our sin, like the wind, have taken us away. But you see, God warned Israel about that. God really warned Israel and says, you know what, don't allow your sin to lift you up. Because even you do fade like a leaf. You're nothing in my sight. Look at verse 7. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. Yeah, there's been plenty of people in the world down through the years who have been famous one second and forgotten the next. Why? Because they've faded off. You know, our body is prone to break down and when we get older, we get slower and we get weaker and we get fainter and then before we know it, we fade off into eternity and we're forgotten why? because we're nothing we're nothing in the sight of God he says for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities see God consumed the nations before Israel, why? Because of their iniquity, because of their sin, because of their wickedness. But let me just say this. It was only by the grace of God that Israel was allowed to go into that promised land. Only by the grace of God. If we think about that word grace... It describes for us receiving, receiving. See, Israel was going to receive something that they did not deserve. For us, the word grace doesn't mean anything different. It means receiving something that we do not deserve from God. For us, it is salvation. Because of our sin. You see, we don't deserve it. Our iniquities before God, our sin, is like filthy rags. It is unclean. You know, you can get a, a rag. And I grab a rag before I do a service on my car. And by the time I'm finished doing the service on that car, it is filthy it is black you see it's a picture of what our sin is before God filthy you know he didn't have to provide salvation for us he didn't it was only by his grace that he did that if you put grace written down a page Right, G-R-A-C-E. 
This is what it stands for. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Why? Because God loved us. That he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world that he might die for sinners, which we are. It was only by his grace, providing something that we don't deserve, which is salvation from our sin. You see, for Israel, to go into that promised land, God says, I'm going to go over there before you, and I am going to save you from everyone that is in that land, including all those that you look at and say there's no chance that we can even fight against them. But there was a chance because God was with them. You see, we, as humans before God, we cannot save ourselves from the sin that was entered into our hearts way back in the Garden of Eden, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Adam, the one who sinned with Eve and allowed sin to pass upon all men, that for all have sinned. And now God, in his pure, unmerited favour that he has shown toward us through his grace has given us something that we do not deserve at Christ's expense. See, Jesus Christ paid the price for us on the cross of Calvary. You see, he didn't have to do that. But he did it because he loved us. He did it to fulfill the commandment of his heavenly Father. And he did it with joy. For the joy that was set before him. And now here we are as God's people. And we fail to serve him. Yeah, Israel is really a picture of us. God says, look, I've given you this land. I've given you everything. You know, there were some things in there that they didn't plant or that they didn't build or whatever the case was. And it was there waiting for them. A good land, ready for whatever they wanted to do in there. But they decided to go back to the desert. They didn't want to dwell with the living water. They wanted to be dehydrated and go back out into the desert. Psalm chapter 97. Psalm 97. It says there, the Lord reigneth. You see, God is a supreme being. He is the one that is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is a supreme one. He reigneth. It says, let the earth rejoice. How often do we rejoice as God's people? How often do we rejoice, not because we're full of pride, but because we're happy that God has given us the victory before we even need to fight for anything? You see, 
We might be able to lose our physical life, but we're not going to lose our spiritual one. Why? Because he's paid the price for us. Rejoice, let the multitudes of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlighten the world. The earth saw and trembled. They did see at some stage. And they did tremble. They feared God. They respected him for who he was and is. But we see, we're seeing that fade away today. There's no respect for God until they see him return. Then we'll see a respect for him. There will be a fear return. There will be a trembling because they will understand that he, as a supreme being, has won the victory. And not only over the world, but over sin. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. And, sorry, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. We're out camping the other night and um, I said to Caleb, I said, oh, I can't wait for the sun to go down because where we were, there was no lights. You felt like you could have been anywhere in the middle of anywhere. Couldn't hear anyone else. All we could hear was the sound of the birds, the wind, the deer, the cattle, and the aeroplanes that were coming over. And the aeroplanes. You're saying before that fl planes aren't flying. <laughs> Without a word of a lie, like every minute, there were planes. Same direction. Same direction coming from. Boom, 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 boom. All night, boom, boom, boom. All day, boom, boom, boom. And I thought to myself, hmm, is what we're being told true? It just, it blew my mind. I reckon we could have counted, I don't know, over a hundred planes, like in the afternoon, the night, and the next day. And it didn't seem like anything had changed. It was still the same. But you see, for God, he um, created everything in his righteousness. And all the people see his glory. You see, you can see it everywhere. That's what I was going to say. I was saying to Caleb um, when we're camping that I can't wait for the sun to go down. Why? Because of the stars. The stars, I said, they're going to be awesome tonight.